end. Well, hello and welcome everyone to the BSA Client Conversation Series. I'm Carol Wedge and Principal at Shepley Bullfinch and I'm your host today. I've been the host for the series and our goal has been really to feature clients, their projects and their strategies for managing change and how they're thinking about the future. So this has been a remarkable program, especially during the pandemic. It's allowed us to bring people together, to meet and to share ideas on topics from climate change to healthcare to housing development and so much more. Um, I do wanna highlight that all the videos for the series are on the BSA website. So if you missed one or you'd love to go back and remember what someone said, um, please um, look for those. And also we will be recording this. So um, that one will be available as well. Our final program today, we're continuing to look at strategies in urban space, particularly around resiliency. And I would say with Massport, just complexity. So Luciana Birdie and Peter De Bruin have joined us. Um, they're both at Massport and I'll give you a deeper introduction to them a little bit later. I did talk about, I have a little housekeeping to do and general updates. Um, and so um, Patricia from the BSA is running the slides. You know, there's a number of different programs that we've offered. Um, and so we wanna make sure that you know that you have access to those. Um, I'm gonna ask you to please mute during the presentation and during the Q&A, you can use the chat. You can also take yourself off mute, use the function to raise your hand and I'll call on you. I'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A. Um, so we really do wanna foster a dialogue. Um, as we said earlier, if you just joined us, we are recording this session. Um, so just feel free to be thoughtful about who's in your background. And if there's children playing, that's great. But if you don't want them on the video, feel free to turn off your video. Um, I think you can read the rest about continuing ed. There'll be a link for credits um, for CEUs for this session. Um, and then we wanted to highlight a couple of other programs going on at the BSA, <clears throat> the Mass Timber Accelerator. Um, and just, you know, sort of the vertical climb of learning all of us are doing around Mass Timber. Um, it's a really exciting time and lots to learn. Um, so you can see the link there. Um, and then there's another program um, called Intersections. Um, and it's linking women in design and Bostoma, presenting intersections, equity environment in the city. And it's a symposium in November. So feel free to go to the BSA website and learn more about that. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters who we'll meet today. Um, Dr. Luciana Birdie is the Director of Capital Programs and Environmental Affairs at Massport, Massachusetts Port Authority. I'll only say that once. <laughs> In her role, Dr. Birdie is leading the shift of capital programs towards a more innovative, progressive BIM and design technology driven department. By adopting lean and lean construction principles, she's committed to a culture <clears throat> of continuous improvement. Focus on maximizing value for her customers, quality outcomes, and reducing non-value activities or non-value added activities. Um, Luciana was instrumental in implementing an employee engagement program in the department, which received authority-wide recognition and still exists today. Um, she's building a collaborative team. Prior to joining Massport, Luciana held several positions at DCAM for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Birdie is a member of CMAA, the National Board of Directors, the chair of the Construction Management Association of America, the Emerging Technologies Committee. And in 2015, she received national award in new technologies, techniques, and construction management for advancing the use of valuable new technologies and processes. Um, she earned her CCM, which is Certified Construction Manager um, Certificate in 2019. She's an active member at the BSA, the BIM Roundtable, Lean Construction Institute, and many other organizations focused on these themes. She received her doctorate from the um, Harvard Graduate School of Design. She was a Spurs Fellow, which is a special program in urban and regional studies at MIT. She holds a master's degree, and I'm not gonna say it all in Italian, but it's IUAV in Venice, Italy. And we are so happy that Luciana has been able to make time in her very busy schedule to join us today. Also joining us is Peter De Bruin, is the Climate Mitigation and Resilience Manager for Massport. He owns, well, Massport, not he, <laughs> owns and operates Logan, the Connolly Container Terminal, the Flynn Cruise Port Boston, the Boston Fish Pier, Worcester Airport, and Hanscom Field. So a huge portfolio for that Massport oversees, controls, and innovates. He's responsible for the climate adaptation strategy and developing programs that reduce the impact of Massport's operations on the environment. And I'm sure a lot of you have questions about for Peter. Um, and so we'll have a lively discussion afterwards. 
Prior to joining MassPerk, Peter was the Vice President and Global Program Manager for State Street Corporation's Office of Environmental Sustainability and was focused on greenhouse gas mitigation, renewable energy, and carbon offset strategy. Peter participates in many different organizations in the city, East Boston, Charlestown, Resiliency Steering Committees, and Climate Ready South Boston Advisory Committee. He is very involved with the Greater Boston Research Group, the Advisory Steering Committee, how to update climate change and sea level rise projections for Metro Boston. So you can see we're weaving all of this together today around resiliency and how Massport's thinking about that. Peter has a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Maine at Orno um, and an MBA from Michigan State University. So it is my great pleasure to turn the program over to Luciana and Peter. Great, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for the BSA to inviting us. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Uh, let's see. And, uh, and I, uh, I loved the, the breakout session. I, there were very few people, I'd say nobody that I knew. So it was a great opportunity for me to meet new people. And I hope that will be last long and, and we'll be able to see them submitting to our projects. So as Carol mentioned, um, Peter and I will split the presentation. We'll cover two, um, two definition of resiliency. I will cover more from a human resiliency, you know, what happened through COVID and I'll spend, I'll try to spend as little time as possible as I would like to give Peter as much time as possible to cover his very interesting topic, but he's leading for us and then it, on the, for the authority and for capital program. So going back to what Carol was saying, this is just an understanding of what Massport covers, right? We have an aviation business line, the maritime business line, the real estate business line, right? We own, manage and operate three airports and then the Conley, the Flint Cruise Port, the, the Seafood and the Boston Outport and then South Boston is Boston and a bunch of properties in Charlestown as well. Um, so what happened? What happened to us? Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were shooting high. Uh, we were growing 5% a year. We were uh, doing so well uh, as a lot of other business and a lot of other, uh, a lot of other owners in our situation. So we were really forecasting in uh, uh, a 45 million passenger, uh, huge economic growth. You saw that we were never growing so, so well and so fast. And then this little virus came and, and we all crashed. Um, so it's, a, if you, it's funny that it doesn't show in the, in the image on the right, but we really had on, I think, March 15, if you see our passenger where it went from the number that we used to have all the way down, it's an interesting um, chart to see. But the positive note is that we are rebounding. Uh, we are not rebounding as fast as we were doing pre-pandemic, uh, but we are trending well. And we believe that within the next three to five years, we'll be able to get back to our 2019 uh, number. So you see in the projection on the image on the right, uh, red is our uh, low, you know, it's the worst case scenario. The green was our best case scenario. And uh, the line in, uh, in black is what is the current. So we're doing better than our best case scenario, uh, which, is, uh, which is good. So if you we look at uh, if we look a little bit on of uh, what what's really happening in the uh, from a, an international versus the domestic, you can see that a lot of uh, uh, a lot of airlines are bouncing back. Right, you have Delta that's ninety percent. Uh, with a pre compared to pre pandemic, American as well, JetBlue, it's a little behind. But if you go on the other side of the chart, you'll see that we, we are still behind on the international. And this is because, you know, um, we have not fully open to, uh, to, I think there was a, a, a news last week that we, starting in November, we might ease some, uh, some, um, some restriction uh, for, uh, for European countries to come. So you can see that the European slide compared to 2019 is still only 37%. 
So um, if we look at the maritime, even there, we had a huge decrease, right, uh, due to the pandemic. We were able to bring in the three new, uh, the biggest crane, uh, the heaviest crane that are in existence. And I think there was a big, a big event. We we're actually planning to have a major event in a couple of weeks. Uh, with the governor, this is great because it's making our port ready for the big ships. Um, but if we look at uh, how many ships came after between the pandemic, we had a huge decrease as well. And same things for the cruise. So you can see that 2019, uh, we had 402,000 passengers. We were planning to have 440,000 passengers and we actually got zero. Uh, but obviously we have to follow, we, in some way we're following what are the CDC directive. So we have a projection, a positive projection for the next uh, for the next fiscal year but we had to manage uh, these fast changing uh, fast changing happenings through the pandemic so how did we do it what did we have to do to really from a mass port perspective but also from a capital program perspective right we uh, we capital program and mass were reacted uh, similarly, right? So there are uh, the, one of the first and the major, um, major, obviously when uh, we had some, um, some projects that we were planning to do usually when the load was low. So we had the runway 927 uh, was going to be done in September, October in, of 2020. We actually did it in May. So we were able to accelerate some airside project and take advantage from the low, uh, low passenger and low flights. We also uh, were able to expedite other roadway work. Uh, at the same time, we needed to continue to see to have make sure that we have our worker were safe and secure so one of the things that we did we basically develop our own app and we develop our own construction employee screening so that we could continue to do work uh, while other cities and town put everything in all on in every construction so we were able to be agile in, in the ability of really uh, embrace this change um, we also um, reduce off um, hours, um, you know, we reduce the off hour work for building construction and we start to utilize uh, in our talent. So we were asked to reduce, uh, you know, sadly for you, we were asked to reduce our uh, consultant work. So we brought in house a lot of the work, uh, especially for the air side work where we have talent and we use in house talent to do that. So we, at the same time, we had to do a huge reduction on the capital plan. The capital plan that was going to be approved was a $4 billion five-year capital plan. And we had to reduce by 1 billion. So those are the list of some of the major projects that we had to, we had to reduce. You know, the terminal lead picture on the left is the terminal lead parking garage. And then the one on the right is the addition of three additional floors for the Framingham Logan Express, right? And we also, so had the cruise terminal uh, renovation and announcement project that was just started. We just selected the consultant we had to put on hold. Um, other project, as I mentioned earlier, had to uh, continue to go ahead or advance faster. So uh, we continued uh, the terminal B to C roadway and actually a major phase is starting next month in December. We continue the connection between the two terminal, terminal B and terminal C, uh, which will open summer 2022. Uh, we continue the phase one for terminal E, which will open in summer 2023. And we were able to, uh, uh, to bring earlier, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the rehab of uh, runway 927. Uh, we were able to bring it from July to May, which was a, a great effort and a great reduction of expenses too, from our perspective. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, there was a huge shift. My department has to move, has to shift uh, directors. And so the leadership of the department changed as well. Uh, so in December, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, the, the former director um, uh, retired from Massport and uh, I was promoted into this position. Uh, I was not uh, in a complete new phase. I was, I was the deputy director for 
almost 10 years, eight years. Uh, so, but it still uh, it was a shift and a change for my department. So uh, one of the first effort that I did is looking at the vision. And this is really the vision and the mission that our new department has embraced. Um, and uh, the value stream uh, that we are developing. Again, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not, you know, we can talk about this if there are questions, but I'm not going to uh, talk too much about this. So what else have we done? Some of the uh, some of the challenges that we had uh, with a lot of people working from home, 50% of my department was working from home and 50% was here, uh, was really continuing the uh, making sure that we were continuing continuing to have uh, communication. So we instituted monthly town hall meetings, which are continuing now. It's one of the things that my staff actually like to do. Uh, we, uh, pre-pandemic, we had this effort of the Good Morning Monday. So every Monday, uh, there, is a, a, there is an email in which elaborate on what happened in the department. Uh, so what projects are working on uh, from, from the week previous. So Peter can explain what is the benefit, but everybody sees it's to maintain communication was a critical thing to do. We also instituted, uh, uh, this is a kind of a lean things too. It's uh, mm -hmm. the EMT calls as every, every morning at 7.30, mm -hmm. the executive management team uh, has a quick call, 15, 20 minutes, in which we basically communicate. And our, our department is split in many units. So to eliminate the silo, this has been a critical effort that we have done and the department is in benefit too. Um, as an authority, we have embraced a more flexible schedule policy. So there are people that are working, not primarily from home, but due to, through the pandemic, they were 100% from home, uh, and now they're slowly starting to come back. Um, we we have, uh, as mentioned earlier, strengthened our in-house design effort. So we are issuing design, uh, and we, we are basically producing our own. We are a small firm. We are producing our own drawings, writing our own specs, right? Um, and something that was uh, critical to me is uh, making sure that uh, so maybe this is not as um, as important in the in the private firms and maybe it's, there is a clear professional path. Something that I've seen and I've heard many times is that there is, especially for the younger staff, what what is the path of progression within the authority. So it's a big effort, uh, and I'm working with a lot of my team to develop that. We also take the time to listen to all the consultants. We are having at least two sessions with consultants every week to get new consultants introduced to us. And, uh, and we are making a larger effort internally to modify how our capital CIP uh, is, uh, is developed and uh, in the process. Um, what's happening in the, in the future, and this is my last slide before I give it to Peter. Um, we are continuing to work. We have been asked to continue to work on the professional path. Uh, we are continuing to have uh, a, to the town hall. Uh, we are uh, looking into increasing or developing some onboarding uh, effort using technology. So we are recording a lot of the session that we give uh, and we are um, training session and maybe partner with, uh, with uh, you, you know, I, I heard that MassiOT as a MassiOT university, maybe partner with some of you some of the BSA, some of the, some, you know, BSA or other um, entities to develop a knowledge share. Uh, and then I'm developing some training for my staff, lean training and BIM VDC training um, to, to continue uh, refreshing and making sure that my staff is, still, is up to speed to this new technology and new way of doing business. I leave it now to Peter, who's going to be focusing more on the pure resiliency and the Net zero effort uh, that is one of the big priorities of the, the authority. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Luciana, and welcome everybody. It's so nice to see everybody today. So I appreciate the time. Um, so our approach uh, to climate change is perhaps not surprisingly a two-pronged approach focused on both mitigation um, and adaptation. And the adaptation really began in 2013 with the impact, well, uh, Hurricane Sandy, of course, impacting New York in 2012, 
but then really kind of looking at that and realizing that uh, that that Boston could be impacted if that was 150 miles north, uh, that storm could have uh, wreaked some, some, some serious damage here. So Massport's um, adaptation efforts really began in earnest at that time with a risk assessment. Um, and I can talk more about that, but basically on the adaptation side, looking at um, hardening our, our, our assets, developing standards um, and operational plans for the response across all aviation and maritime uh, operations. And then the mitigation work, of course, um, really so important and uh, initially prompted by the development of the Logan Sustainability Management Plan, which was developed in 2015, and continuing with um, current efforts to develop a climate roadmap, which is really focused on decarbonization and alignment. Um, if I could just ask everybody to Can folks please mute. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so on the mitigation side uh, and adaptation side, we're working uh, um, right now on a on a roadmap, which we want to be in a, in align at least in alignment with the with the Commonwealth's roadmap decarbonization roadmap. Um, and we'll have more to say about that uh, going forward, but we're working on that and hope to uh, finalize that by the end of the year. Next slide, please. Um, so when you think about, you know, airports, obviously Logan in our uh, category of, of operations and sites is um, perhaps one of the most complex uh, sites. Um, there's a lot of different categories of, uh, of impacts that, that you can look at, you know, you can see some of them here, but this just kind of gets to the complexity um, and the interrelationships of everything that we need to address. So, you know, obviously in that first category, there are the things that are within Massport's uh, control, including the operations, um, uh, the transit vehicles and shuttles and fleets. Uh, the building energy, uh, the fuels that are used in all of these uh, various locations and equipment. Um, and then, you know, the ways that we try and uh, address that through energy usage, renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency, and, and thinking more boldly and in big terms, in, term, in ways, you know, we can continue to look at uh, achieving full decarbonization as quickly uh, as possible. The second category there being, you know, things that we can influence. Um, obviously, we've got uh, partners and, and tenants, both, you know, the retail tenants, for example, that you see as you come through the terminals, um, as well as the airlines, the fuelers, the, the caterers, and on the uh, maritime side, obviously, um, the cargo carriers, the cruise lines, the commercial fishermen. And of course, other uh, tenants on the real estate and asset management side, primarily uh, in South Boston, but also in, in Charlestown and, and uh, East Boston as well. Um, and then there are those things that are uh, within airline control. Um, you know, obviously the emissions from aircraft um, being, um, being one of the biggest impacts. Um, and while we can still influence that through things um, and policies that we could adopt, for example, by facilitating uh, the infrastructure for sustainable aviation fuel, it's still clearly within the airline's um, area of responsibility. And then the fourth category there uh, is air traffic control and, and the FAA, um, the routing of, uh, of aircraft um, and how that works. And I know there's been you know, in increasing efforts to look at that to minimize uh, everything from taxing to flight patterns um, to reduce the emissions associated uh, with that. Next slide, please. Um, so when you take a deeper uh, dive into all of that, um, you know, you're looking at a number of different categories, again, using the airport as, as the biggest example on the, on the transportation side, um, the shuttles, the buses, um, and, and so forth, and, and looking at things that we've done already, and some of which turned out to be interim, uh, you know, strategies, uh, things like the certified uh, uh, natural uh, gas uh, vehicles, for example, and recognizing that we need to advance those efforts, uh, but being challenged by, you know, having, having uh, assets and infrastructure 
that have life expectancies measured in the decades and not just a, a couple of years. Um, you know, then we, you've got the support facilities. Uh, we have a central heating plant here uh, at uh, Logan, which uh, is continually being evaluated and upgraded um, to provide the most efficient heating and cooling for the terminals. And then of course the terminals uh, themselves, which um, are in a constant state of uh, upgrading and uh, expansion. Um, and then the construction activities uh, across all of uh, operations, not just here at the airport, but looking at those. And, you know, we're really trying to think about that in terms of the design and construction um, and things like embodied carbon, which we hope to more formally address within our uh, upcoming climate action plan. Next slide, please. Um, and then airside impacts, um, you know, at the gate itself, looking at things and, and having implemented uh, preconditioned air, ground power, um, and then uh, things that are directly under the airline's control, electric ground support equipment, which many of the airlines have, have had for years. Delta has had electric ground support equipment. Um, anecdotally, we've heard from operators that they actually prefer that equipment. It's quiet. It doesn't uh, have the pollution associated with the diesel equipment. Uh, and apparently it's just a better ride. So um, there's a lot that can be done, uh, you know, continue to be done that way, but also looking at things um, more specifically in terms of taxing and, and some of these strategies having uh, already been implemented, as well as coordination with uh, the FAA and the airlines in terms of delay programs um, and, and looking at that to make sure that we're minimizing the time that that aircraft is, um, is running on its own fuel um, and then, of course, longer term advancing uh, the more efficient aircraft, the transition of those aircraft to sustainable aviation fuel, and ultimately starting with the, the smaller and regional aircraft, um, uh, incorporating uh, electric aircraft, which uh, organizations such as Cape Air and others are, uh, are rapidly advancing. Next slide. So um, on the maritime side, you know, similar diagrams, but somewhat uh, less complex uh, looking at the operations. Um, and we've done uh, uh, recent inventories of, of this to look at uh, the mass port owned cargo uh, handling equipment, uh, the vehicles and the stationary sources, which are, you know, the primary sources of the scope one emissions throughout the port activities, both at Conley Terminal and the cruise port. And then um, the scope two, obviously, um, the purchased utilities for the buildings, the heavy duty uh, vehicles, uh, the yard trucks, the, the uh, semi-tractor trailers that are delivering the uh, containers to and from Conley Terminal and then the employee commuting. And then, of course, you know, similar to the, to the airport, um, the third party um, uh, vessels, in this case, ocean going vessels, the harbor craft, um, that uh, come in and out of uh, the port are areas that we're looking at uh, and continuing to engage with those, um, those partners uh, to, to see how we can advance uh, their efforts. And that's a pretty complex uh, equation as well. It's, it's hard to do things in isolation, you know, with one port, particularly on, on the, uh, the Eastern seaboard um, with things like, you know, shore power um, and the standard, standardization of equipment um, and the expectations of, of uh, the cruise lines and, and ocean uh, cargo carriers. The next slide, please. So in terms of our uh, adaptation, um, this image was from, um, from Tropical Storm Riley in March of 2018. Um, you know, this is an ongoing challenge and, and we are constantly informed and, and looking at our, our plans, our responses, our technology, you know, uh, I, I look at most recently what happened in New York City with the remnants of, of Hurricane Ida and the response and the reaction um, to that and the key takeaways um, as, as learning opportunities, but also realizing the sense of urgency um, with which we need to address not just um, heavy precipitation events and coastal storms, uh, but sea level rise, um, um, you know, uh, sorry, heat island effect, high winds, and, and, and everything else that, that goes along with it. Um, next slide, please. So when, when we take a look at this, you know, I, I'm just putting out this out there as, as one example. We have um, lots of these types of maps. This is 
um, obviously a risk assessment in terms of looking at uh, the various properties and the impacts of a sea level rise and, and various storms. In this case, what's frequently referred to as a hundred year storm in the year 2070 um, with approximately uh, 40 inches of a uh, sea level rise. So these are the impacts on, on that. Um, and you know what we need to do is look at um, obviously flood entry pathways by, by that timeline as well as other interim timelines and, and then um, continue to enhance um, the, uh, the, both the response and the hardening of assets, as I, as I mentioned before. And in many cases, you know, particularly in South Boston and in places like the auto port, it's tenant operated um, sites. So we need to engage uh, with them to understand, you know, where they're at, what their plans are and share our expertise uh, and knowledge with them. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, we have a host of, of reports and studies and, and plans, starting with the initial disaster infrastructure resiliency planning in 2014 uh, and, and being upgraded, of course, with uh, flood operations plans, both for Logan and maritime assets. And then um, our Massport Floodproofing Design Guide, uh, which was published in 2015 and is available on the Massport website. So these are operational plans uh, to guide us, but they are simply that. Um, they need to be constantly evaluated and trained to. And in fact, we do annual training, which could include uh, tabletop exercise. Um, we generally, when we do exercises like that, we, we look at what we think are worst case examples. So 500 year storm events, um, both now and in the future, and how would we respond to that? Um, what we're seeing now, however, is that um, what you think are the worst case storm events are quickly exceeded in terms of um, severity or frequency uh, or impacts. Although what we've seen and, and particularly noted in, um, in tropical, excuse me, in uh, the nor'easter uh, Riley in March of 2018 is that the forecasting of flood entry pathways uh, proved to be pretty accurate. So where we thought that there might be issues, there, there were issues um, that we could address and, and pre-plan for. Um, the other element to this is um, the technology. So shortly after those impacts, you know, we considered what we had available um, and, and what we needed to do to provide um, transparency and enhance communications and response and used uh, an existing ArcGIS platform that we have um, to map um, locations and to really provide information to those responders and those uh, managers and leaders that were overseeing uh, planning and response operations, uh, both prior to, during, and, and subsequent to uh, severe weather impacts. So um, we use this ArcGIS tool to uh, provide tracking and notification of uh, tidal elevations, tidal forecasts, um, as well as um, where Massport critical infrastructure is, um, what type of priority it had. And then, you know, all those little dots that you see there, you can click into those dots and you can pull up uh, an image of the site. You can see an example of, I think it's a, uh, a uh, substation there. Um, and that, uh, that record actually has site plans. It shows if there's flood barriers, where would, where would they be staged? Where would they be deployed? How would they be set up? Where, where would responders park? Uh, what assets and resources were on site? Uh, and it includes everything from street addresses, uh, bird's eye view of the locations uh, and contact information um, to be available on phones, iPads, and of course desktops um, so that uh, responding resources could uh, take advantage of it. Um, next slide, please. So to, to, to wrap up, um, what I would say is, is going forward, our, our next steps uh, include looking at the Massachusetts Coastal Flood Risk Modeling, um, which uh, the Woods Hole Institute and other partners have been working on. Um, we expect that to be updated with both 2050 and 2100 timeline uh, information, as well as updating um, the rate of sea level rise, which will help uh, inform our planning and response um, but clearly there's also a need um, to engage in district scale and not just building scale uh, resiliency preparation and partner 
with both the city, the Commonwealth, municipalities, um, and uh, to engage in further discussions. Um, in our breakout room, you know, one of the suggestions I offered uh, to facilitate this discussion in, in ways in which each and every one of you and your organizations could uh, be could get involved was to create more of a big room approach to addressing these challenges and to start the conversations to raise your hand to offer information, insights, resources, or simply to ask questions uh, or offer suggestions. Um, the more dialogue there is amongst subject matter experts in terms of how we design, build, operate uh, these assets and infrastructure uh, and equipment, um, the better off we'll be mid and long term as, as we prepare for this. So those are our prepared uh, remarks. I'll turn it back to Luciana uh, and yeah. or our hosts um, to see if there's anything else as we transition to discussion. No, I think, it, thank you, Peter. I'm going to stop sharing, uh, Carol, if that's okay for you. Yeah, I think that's great. And we can have more of a conversation yes. um, with our attendees. Yeah. We're already getting some questions. Um, so one kind of um, like Peter referring to the breakout room I was in, there was discussion about, you know, sort of if our projections are that we have to raise elevations four feet, five feet from existing buildings, existing roadways. What's the philosophy that you're evolving around integrating the landscape, universal access, making it welcoming. You know, I think you've done so much over the last decade to make Logan a much more welcoming airport and feel like inhabiting it was much more comfortable and engaging. So how do you think about weaving those themes together with all of the complexity of climate resilience? Oh, let's see, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, well, just take a look, just share your philosophy a little bit. I mean, it's a big yeah. question, but I think it's one on all of our minds, you know, sort yeah. of. How do you raise a city four to six feet? <laughs> yeah, you know? and you know, the other thing is you, you cannot build walls around everything, right? So um, uh, walls and barriers may, may work in some places and may be required as an interim. Um, the other thing is that, is that codes and, and, you know, the permitting haven't caught up with that. So it's much harder to do things, you know, within a, within a watershed and, and so forth. So, um, and you wanna retain as, as much as possible public access um, to the waterfront um, and engagement, you know, and we're looking at this uh, with the city and other partners at locations around East Boston, Charlestown, and, and South Boston. It, it's really a challenge. What I would say is I'm encouraged by um, the conversations that are happening because I think developers, as, as they're looking at either developing new sites or redeveloping existing sites, are for the most part very well aware of and, and are trying to address um, both the challenges on the one side and the opportunities um, that these represent on, on the other. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're starting to see that uh, not just evolve, but also take it to the next level. How do we build it so um, these areas are inviting, that they're engaging, but they also provide um, levels of protection um, and, and engineering level protection, not just, um, you know, protection that, it, that, that is perceived to see uh, to address challenges uh, both now and in, in the future. One of the things that we're doing, um, for example, with uh, the redevelopment of, of the parks, Piers Park yes. uh, 2, and ultimately uh, what we hope will be Piers Park uh, 3 with the trustees relationship, yeah is to address those challenges. Yeah. Um, Luciana, would you like to talk to any of that? Or Yeah, no, I was just gonna mention that too. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> we are trying to work, those, those are a great uh, topic to discuss and we are engaging in the Pierce Park two and slash three conversation, really on how to address it. It's not easy because again, you have two sets of owner, two sets of architects, landscape architects, we, you know, it's increased complexity, but it's truly needed. So, um, so, you know, Peter, I don't know if you want to add more, but. Well, and I think it's... that's the thing that inspires many of us. You're in a role where you have to bring compl complex constituencies together and it always starts as complicated, right? <laughs> You know, so how the art of developing that. I do have to apologize. I've been mispronouncing Luciana's name. So oh, that's fine. You know, I'll work on my Italian. <laughs> so, um, but don't I, worry I, about it. Yeah, I also wonder how, um, Luciana, how you and Peter connect with people around the world. Like this isn't just a Boston problem or an American problem. It's a global problem. And are there countries that you think are 
inspiring to you or conversations that start to feel like, again, like Peter said, there's a big room approach, but with, you know, airports around the world or other countries that are maybe a little bit ahead of us in their advocacy for preparing for climate change? Yeah, Peter, you want to talk about Europe? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so in 15 minutes or less, I guess, I, you know, Europe's a, uh, a great example uh, in many different ways. Um, we are constantly looking at, you know, what European airports are doing, as well as, of course, you know, airports in the United States and Canada, for that matter, right, as well as ports, and I don't want to preclude ports. Um, so um, a couple of months ago, we, we met with uh, uh, a delegation uh, from, uh, from uh, some of the Scandinavian countries, um, and, you know, they're doing some great, they have a lot of startups addressing, you know, climate tech solutions to, to both the adaptation and mitigation um, the port of Rotterdam is doing wonderful things to address sea level rise, right? I mean, the Dutch, you know, my ancestors have been uh, addressing this for, for, for eons, right? So they have learned to live with water in it, and it's what we rapidly need to do. So um, <clears throat> there are examples and solutions that are out there um, and dialogues that are starting to happen or have been continuing uh, both on the aviation as well as the maritime side because we certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, we're here to work and to preserve the, the working waterfront and the industrial uh, uses and purposes, for example, on the maritime side and the seafood processing um, and, and you know, the cargo handling and, and the vehicles that, that get transited here uh, via the port of Boston and to keep that going you know, decades and decades into the future. Um, so we want to look at what those best practices are best practices are, we want to hear those ideas. Um, Luciana, do you want to add anything to that or direct that conversation differently? Uh, no, no, I think you did great. Okay. Well, I was going to, I was going to take you in a slightly different direction, maybe not quite sure. so global. Um, how can, how do you think about advocacy for, you know, advocating for all of the incredible funding you're going to need? And I'm sure that's at the, you know, sort of local level, the state level, the federal level, but also how can the other members of the BSA and the AEC industry be partners in the advocacy? You know, sort of, can you just talk a little bit about how complex yeah. that is, but also so, where you need more voices to say yeah. this is critically important? Yeah, so I think the voices are there. I think the more there is a discussion, I think that, you know, the, the industry is doing a good job in advocating. Uh, what is uh, what we are doing now? We are making a huge effort to understand where we can get in into the federal funds, right? This infrastructure bill, you know, the Mass Massachusetts, uh, you know, Peter is working with uh, the strategic planning team to understand what do we do and when, you know, what are the efforts? And this is, it's all part of the big strategy. So there are working groups that are looking uh, and we have, uh, so the uh, one example, the Framingham Logan Express, right? It's a great HPV example. It's a great, so we are having it into parking lot, right? Uh, we're submitting it. We did submit it for, for, for a grant. And if we get it, it was out of the capital program, we'll put it in. So we're going to have a capital program and then a separate bucket of project, which we are, you know, we're keeping them alive enough that if something comes, some grants come, we are able to just uh, resuscitate them very quickly. So that's great. There's a couple questions that are a little closer to the ground. Um, one is about if Massport's exploring or interested in green hydrogen solutions, particularly aviation and maritime use cases, and that may be a real technical answer. Peter, that seems like one, yeah, okay. yep. one to go to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, there, you know, that industry continues to evolve and we're, tra we're tracking it. We've been meeting with and speaking to subject matter experts and in terms of green hydrogen and if it is in fact even green. Um, <clears throat> the challenge is, you know, there, there is... Uh, there's just like sustainable aviation fuel, you know, what's behind it? And is it truly green? Where is it coming from? Can we scale it? Um, you know, there's, there's staunch proponents of it. Um, and there's, there, there's people who are questioning it. Um, so we are looking at all options. You know, our CEO has instructed us with the development of the climate plan um, to be bold and think, uh, think big. Uh, so 
we're looking at all possible solutions, but it also has to be practical, right? It has to work um, either today in, in the interim in the 2030s and 40s and 50s and certainly be a longer term and viable solution and, and obviously be informed by conversations and constituents and stakeholders um, at the local state, the, the national uh, level, because there are solutions out there that, that communities don't want, right? Uh, they, they don't wanna see more of, of option X over option Y. Um, they'd like to address a problem over here that could actually be a solution over there. Um, so that's a lot of complexity. Um, and we are looking at things like, like green hydrogen, but also you know, trying to understand just like with sustainable aviation fuel, is it truly green? Can it truly be scaled? Is it something that we can develop in our location on the East Coast? It, it, has it been done elsewhere that we could learn from it? Or could we be a leader and facilitate the, the adoption of it? Um, and so with that, we work with uh, a number of other entities, including uh, the, Massachusetts, uh, the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, Mass DOER, industry organizations, um, but would also, you know, of course, extend an open invitation if people have ideas and suggestions, you know, reach out, let us know, tell us, connect with us, um, participate in the groups that we're participating in, offer these ideas, because I'm always amazed at what we think we know, and then the next day we find out <laughs> we really didn't know enough about right. it. Right. Yeah. Continuous improvement is, you know, exactly. sort of the, the philosophy. It's exciting to see you bringing that kind of boldness and innovation and really making room for that, but also doing the harder work of, is does it really work? I'm gonna let you go in a slightly different direction. When we prepared for this conversation, we talked about, you have a nice audience of architects, engineers, contractors, many people who either work for you or would love to work with you. Can you talk a little bit about being the owner and coach these designers and engineers and consultants a bit on, you know, sort of continuous improvement in our relationships how we re respond to the requests you make of us in proposals and um, qualifications and just dream a little bit about what you would love, you know, if you could be the change agent around some of that, um, what are some of the clues you might give people? Yeah, I can, I can start and then Peter can, uh, can go more detail on the net zero. Uh, one of the bigger efforts that we have done is really changing the, our uh, RFQs, the request for qualification for the consultant. So for those of you who were there before, like uh, uh, even six months ago, uh, pre-pandemic, we had like 12 unranked, unweighted uh, uh, selection criteria, which was making it very, very difficult to, for a consultant to respond, to understand which of these 12 needed to be responded better or more in depth. Right? Uh, we made an effort to simplify and to streamline the selection criteria. And now there are five equally weighted. So which means, which strongly means that you should put as much effort as in all of the five of them. And I, I think the consulting still industry is still learning uh, because I'm not seeing the quality in the responses. So uh, please take the same amount of time in responding to all the five. So the first one is usually the experience uh, in projects, the experience of the project manager, the experience of the team, uh, the experience of the sub-consultant, right? And so the first two are really related to your approach to the project. Even as an RFQ, we would love to have, we would like you to see it more as an RFP, right? Bring up some proposals. We are trying to make a bigger effort in putting more content into the into uh, into the, the the RFQs, the solicitations, so that you can get some bright ideas. And they probably are not going to be the ideas that we're going to be implementing, but in some way we like to see what are your ideas, how creative you are. So put it in, even if it's unachievable, like make us say, wow, look at this, um, right? Uh, the third the selection criteria is BIM and Lean. You all know how a bigger effort, it's really using technology, virtual design and construction and lean, the efficiency in what we see it. And is not, yes, we know how to use lean or yes, we do, we know. My expectation is all of you use BIM. If you are not using BIM, I'm really urging you to get a little bit there. 
because I, I, you know, this is my ex, but 101, you should always use Revit by this point, not CAD. Uh, but it, lean is a little different and not your effort, but how you're using it. Again, put some ideas. Oh, we will be using this tool, you know, it's uh, is, uh, uh, done you know the i understand that your marketing team often put these things on but i'm urging the marketing team to reach out to the project manager and to understand it uh, also from uh, we don't want the marketing material we want a real uh, proposal so uh, there is a great effort from the marketing team but make sure on the lean that they all the entire proposal talks lean because I, I can sense I have a lean, uh, a lean uh, radar. I know, sense, radar, <laughs> thank you, where if I see that you're using lean, all fancy stuff, only when you respond to the lean, but then you talk about usual process in your the response on your first selection criteria, right? Oh, I'm going to have my usual meeting, then then I can see that, you know, you're not really embracing lean because Lean, it's just how the way you do business. It's not how you check a, a, a box, right? Um, and then the fourth one is the net zero. And uh, going back to what Peter was saying, we want to have ideas. Uh, you know, what, what it's be creative. Even if probably what, you, what you're proposing won't be achievable or we'll say no because it's too expensive or whatever, any reason, but we don't want you to uh, bring us ideas. So use this as an opportunity to show your ideas as Peter was mentioning earlier, right? Uh, and then Peter, you can complete that, but I want to just touch upon the M&W, uh, which is an equally weighted too. So uh, it's not only a percentage that you put a minority and woman on business enterprise, but is, is how you're using them, uh, how you are, you know, where is the diversity of the team? Uh, what are you doing? Are you involved with the BSA, woman in design? You know, what, what else are you doing as a company uh, to foster more creativity and more diversity of thought in your ultimate product? So, uh, and Peter, you want to add something on the net zero, how you will like to read? Yeah, I, I you know, everything's got to be put, for me, everything's got to be put in context in terms of how it's supporting Massport's climate roadmap and decarbonization efforts. And I would challenge each and every one of you to put, whether it's stormwater infrastructure or mechanical equipment, um, tell us how it's going to impact, how it's going to provide energy efficiency, how it's going to reduce emissions, um, how it's going to make passenger experience better, um, how uh, you're going to measure embodied carbon or reduce embodied carbon. Um, and, and then the, the other thing, and it, it's almost embarrassing to have to say this, I'm still surprised at uh, proposals I see where titles don't match the content that's beneath it or vice versa, um, questions that are not fully answered or don't have uh, enough detail to it to really bite into it. Um, and it gets back to, to Luciana's point around you know, tell us your ideas. I don't want to hear about something that we heard about 10 years ago. I, I want to hear about what's happening right now. Um, and uh, even if it may not be practical for us at that time, that's going to get us thinking more deeply about it. So take the time to answer questions uh, completely and in a fashion that shows, you know, you're thinking ahead, you're anticipating needs, but also addressing, you know, current challenges and efforts that, that we're working in and, and that we've mentioned, you know, today, for example. That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's really and attention, yeah. And attention to detail is important. I'm still seeing proposals that use Massport logo with a bridge. It's been 10 years that we have no bridge. So <laughs> please don't put it in the cover page. I know that you're, online you can find many logos, but we, are, we do not have the bridge anymore. That's yeah. great. That's great. So <laughs> please ask questions, folks, in the chat. Um, we have a few more minutes. And one one question I wanted to just put to both of you, you know, it feels like you're fostering this culture of innovation and creativity and willingness to ask questions. How do you stay motivated and energized when your jobs, when you just explain them, seem kind of endless? Are there ways that you're thinking about just how to prioritize or you know, sort of how to stay focused on what's most important. Um, you both have incredibly large 
purviews and just interested in how you think about your role. So I can start from the very high uh, level. Um, my, so my role, I see my role as supporting uh, the, the deliverable of the project, supporting my staff, right? And, but at the same time, I see as the one that is pushing my staff to do a little bit more. Peter, you can attest it. I always ask the weird questions. And uh, <laughs> so I like, think about this. And this is how, this is how BIM and Lean came, right? It's always, uh, what else is out there? I, uh, and I tell my consultant, please don't, don't have me be the one asking the question about bringing innovation. I like to stay, me and Peter, we think the same. We like to stay up to speed. You know, we read a lot. We look also always to articles and things. We share articles to each other. We'll text each other. And the department is doing that too. But I often ask my, my consultant and contractor, why do I have to be the one bringing ideas? Can you bring ideas to me? Please. So I'm telling everyone, please, it's, I am, uh, I'm always open to ideas, uh, even the craziest ideas. I'm trying to find a way to use the little spot dog in one of my job site. And I cannot believe it. There's nobody, I have 10 ideas on how to use the little dog, uh, the little uh, robot dog. I don't know how many of you have seen the Boston Dynamic little spot dog, but everybody's like afraid to fail. So I am, one of my efforts is to make sure that my staff feels okay to, to bring ideas and to try it, pilot. And then if it fails, it, I'm saying, let's, let's have a lesson learned. It's not failing. Let's see what we learn so we don't do it next time. I'm not, I don't know if I'm achieving this. And Peter probably won't tell you the truth here in front of me. But. It's <laughs> but that's your philosophy. So that's, that's really helpful. Yes. <clears throat> so as I understand the dog, I haven't seen it in person in action, but it's a 3D scanner that sort of walks the, it's a robot that walks the job site and takes kind of 3D views and assimilates yeah, can do many, many things. Model. Yes. yes. Yeah. Can do many, many things. So one of the ideas that I had, so we have FOD, right? So we have actual people drive the runways. To, to find foreign object device, things that can crash a plane, right? Yeah. <laughs> Simply put. Dead birds you know, and everything else. Right, yeah. anything. So now we have humans to do that. And I don't think we are perfect. Uh, see, I'm I need to start using glasses too. We, but if we start sending or in Hanscom, we, have, we are checking our fences because we have deers that comes and can, can cause problems, right? So my idea is like, maybe we can start sending this little spot dog and you can download the picture. How, how worse can be of people's human's eyes? At least yeah. this guy can look 360. We, can, we don't have a 360 view yet. But right. so uh, those are things, but there is the human fear of like, oh my God, are we really gonna trust the robot? Uh, to me, it's fascinating. But, yeah. So Peter, I want to give you a couple couple minutes to just answer that your philosophy about navigating all of this complexity. Um, you know, kind of what's your north star as you think about your role? Well, um, keeping it real, right? But um, yeah, good, capital programs is a high performing organization. Massport's a high performing organization of incredibly de dedicated and talented people. Um, and I see my role as a facilitator and a convener. So, you know, I, I want to get ideas spinning and get one going over here and then get people working on that. And then, you know, when that's working, we, we've got another one over here. It's another challenge, opportunity, something. But I, I think the, one of the most important things, and Luciana has been a really, <clears throat> excuse me, really good at, at focusing on this, is the human element. Um, the past year and a half, we, we don't know the toll it's it's taken on people's day-to-day -day psyches and ability to, to fully focus. So you have to understand it, even in a high performing, you know, complex environment that there's a human element that that helps you achieve that that success. Um, you don't know what any one person's going through on any one particular uh, day. Um, so, you know, there's a long history of, of performance and engagement and um, attention to detail and everything else that goes into, into what makes us successful. Um, but to Luciana's point, learn from mistakes, learn from challenges and, and issues, 
um, go back, do retrospectives, talk to people. Um, but my North Star is, you know, what's next? And um, hoping for that day when I can get on the, the silver line, I'm, a, I'm a, a public transit person myself, and I'm not getting on a silver line bus that switches from electric to uh, diesel uh, <laughs> <laughs> to get to the airport. So that gets back to my for, first point, keeping it real. What's tangible? What can we do? You know, let's get done what we need to get done today, and then we'll, we'll, re, we'll refresh, we'll work on what needs to get done um, in the figurative uh, tomorrow and, and keeping that uh, in mind that it's all being done by people um, just like you and me. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to close our program. A huge thank you to the two of you, Luciana and Peter. We so appreciate your leadership and your role um, in taking us forward and learning from you and learning together. Um, please stay engaged in the BSA. I think you have so much to learn from how you're navigating your roles. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you'll join other BSA virtual and in-person programs. You can find those on the website. Um, we want to thank our supporting partner, SMPS, and we hope you'll stay up to date with all things going on at the BSA. Hope you have a great rest of the week um, and see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carol, and thank Everybody. you to the BSA. Thank, thank you, you, Luciana. It was so, it was so interesting. It's uh, mind boggling how, thank much, you. <laughs> how much you guys are overseeing. So take care of yourself. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah Bye -bye. There's big, those are big jobs. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Right, thanks, too. everybody. Thanks, thanks for joining. Bye-bye.